All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, so we will probably have one or two schools pop in from this point on, but right now I would like to go ahead and welcome very much, thank you, Brandon Bustide. He is the director of the direct, executive director from Gallup Education. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah, and, and welcome. I think it, the, the one news feed I'm seeing is Chinook. Good morning. How are you all doing out there? Good morning. Good morning. Hello. We're doing good. well in Chinook. Good, good. And am I right? Is this the first week you guys are back in school? Yes. We've had two three day weeks. This will be our first full five day week. All right. Well, good stuff. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I, uh, I, I know that there were a couple of um, short articles that might have been distributed um, to you in advance, and so hopefully you've had a chance to read a couple of them. I'm going to, I'll, I'll go through a little bit of a brief presentation, but I'm going to make sure I stop uh, every couple minutes and um, ask a couple questions and actually get your thoughts on some things. But let me just tell you real quick what I do. I, I love my job, first of all. I work for Gallup. Many of you know Gallup because of its polling name, right? We've been doing polling in the United States for some 70 plus years, but that's actually one of the smallest parts of our organization, interestingly enough. We um, essentially sit on what I like to think of as the world's largest research platform. So for example, we have uh, the World Poll where we're sampling 98% of the world's population every year. So 160 plus different countries where we have representative samples asking all kinds of questions about what's important in their lives. So if you can just imagine, if you want to know what the whole world is thinking, there's people at Gallup who actually kind of know the answers to that, which is very cool. We also do a lot of measurement, and I, I say this because it's going to be important in our conversation. We do a lot of work measuring workplace engagement for companies, nonprofit organizations, government entities where we measure what it means to be engaged in your job. And if you all think about obviously where you're headed, you know, what you're learning in school and what you're trying to think about as a, you know, a next step in career, you're going to spend somewhere between 40 and 60 years in your career, right? So you obviously want to make sure that you get it right, that you land on uh, a place where you're engaged in your work and engaged in your workplace. So um, so these are all things that Gallup studies and researches, including engagement in school and engagement in college. So I want to start real quick, though, with, a, with a, a kind of a question for you guys, and you can maybe vote by show of hands and tell me what you think, but the, I want to start with the end in mind. So let me give you uh, an imaginary person, right? Let's just call her Hannah. She graduated from Harvard. She had a uh, 3.9 GPA. She was top in her class. Uh, she got into Harvard because she had super high SAT scores, let's just say a 1480 on the SAT. Um, she was valedictorian of her high school class. And she graduates Harvard and gets a job working for an investment banking firm making $100,000 a year. That example right now is an example of success on every single measure that we measure you students on, that we measure teachers on, that we measure schools on, because she did well in school, she got good grades, she had super great scores on standardized tests, she got a job that pays a lot of money, right? So would everyone agree that what I just described to you looks like success in every way that we're being measured on right now? Does that make sense? A Little bit? So. So think about that model of success, and now let me throw uh, a little bit of a, uh, of, a, of a ringer around this, which is, the, let's just say she hates the job that she takes. Let's say that she doesn't like what she does every day. Let's say that she doesn't have a chance to do what she does best every day. And so all of that unravels very quickly if you get to a place where you can't say some very fundamental things. I like what I do each day. At work, I have the chance to do what I do best every day. And here's another critical one. I have a manager or supervisor who cares about my development. Those are examples of items that if you say strongly agree to, it means that you're more engaged in your work. So let's just think about this for a minute. We have this person who accomplished everything that we told them to accomplish, right? Good grades, good test scores. But if they end up in a place where they don't like what they do, they aren't doing what they're best at every day, they can be a disengaged employee, that leads to actually having worse health outcomes. 
It's the likelihood that she doesn't rate her life as well as other people do. So I want to get your thoughts on that and, you know, think about from your perspective right now in school. What can you do or what experiences have you had? And I would love to just hear a few examples that get you closer to figuring out what you like to do at a very fundamental level and what you might be best at. So I would love to hear some of the examples of experiences you've had in school that have helped you think carefully about those two things. Chinook, you can go ahead and unmute your microphone for this one. Oh, well, I just moved here to Chinook, and like we had in where I used to live down in Wyoming, we had many different classes, I guess, and in those classes we had we could do a wide range of things and doing those wide range of things we can learn we, we can learn what we do best and what we enjoy yeah so exposure to a wide range of things did you have a choice to pick the kinds of things that you might dig deeper into or study or was it just a bunch of options that you could pick from or a little of both uh, a little of both really i mean we had elective classes that we could do, and then like there was like the enrichment classes where you got to do numerous different tasks, different things, and different subjects that were different uh, things. But it was more of a this. That's what you do, I guess. Yep. What about a couple what? other examples? Experiences in school that get you closer to figuring out what you like to do and what you're best at. All right, so we'll, we'll come back to you. I know it's early in the morning. You guys will warm up, I'm sure. So the um, what I'm showing you here is actually research that uh, Gallup just conducted all across the country with our Gallup student poll. So the, the poll actually interviewed fifth through twelfth graders. So we pick up on elementary school, middle school, and high school. And what I mentioned before was this notion of engagement. So when Gallup measures engagement, we're measuring things like whether you like what you're doing, whether you're doing what you're best at. Interestingly enough, in school, some of the items that are real indicative of being engaged are whether or not you say yes to this question. I have a best friend at school. So to what degree you have strong relationships is likely to increase your engagement in school. Um, in the last week, I've received recognition for work that I've done. So to what degree you're receiving regular recognition and praise from classmates and teachers, etc. So we have several measures of engagement, but as a whole, we look at this, and it's a pretty important measure because students who are engaged are much more likely to perform well in school, get good grades, not just finish high school, but also college. But what I want to show you is this slide that shows that in elementary school, at a national level, about 76% of kids are engaged, and it starts to plummet after that, about 61% in middle school, and then it drops down to 44% in high school. And if you look at this by every year, if I showed you the chart of 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th grade, literally, engagement in school keeps going down every single year. So just think about this for a minute. If we were doing this right, and again, this is national data, so this is not data from Chinook or from Montana, but this is a national level. If we were doing this right, student engagement ought to be going up every year. And so I'm curious uh, for, for you all to comment on what you think is happening here at a national level why is engagement going down every year as opposed to going in the opposite direction what things are taking us in the wrong direction based on experiences you've had we also have had livingston join us this morning so okay great so maybe uh one answer from chinook and then we'll go over to uh our group from livingston next so chinook any uh any quick comments on why you think student engagement goes down <laughs> really strong relationships with friends and family? Uh, we don't really get to talk to our friends during class. or We don't get to do as much stuff with our friends. Austin, what do you think? Uh, teachers don't get paid enough, so they don't really they care less and less. Maybe we pay our teachers more. <laughs> that works. Teachers, teachers who cared more. Yeah, you, you got, you, you're, you're, you're hitting on a lot of interesting points. I mean, the opportunity to be able to build relationships with your friends at school, you know, how much time is actually provided for that, and, uh, you know, thinking about the engagement of teachers. So you actually hit on the point in a very interesting way. Gallup has found in our research 
that the number one driver of student engagement, it's a really simple answer, it's teacher engagement. And so obviously if you have an engaged teacher uh, who's engaged in his or her job, they're going to be much more likely to engage you in school. And there's a lot of factors, obviously, that could drive teacher engagement. And there's some of the same ones that drive student engagement. So think about it from this perspective. If teachers in your building can't say that they have a best friend at work, if teachers in the building aren't being recognized regularly for the work that they're doing, right, all these things that are also important to student engagement, if they're not also happening for teachers in the building, via the principal and assistant principals and people who are managing and motivating them, then obviously we've got an engagement cycle that's kind of broken. Teachers are actually more important to your engagement than parents. So parents play a role in your engagement, but actually teachers have a much more important role in engagement. If you have uh, parents that aren't so engaged in what you're doing in school, but you have a really engaged teacher, that's actually uh, more powerful and, uh, and certainly something to, uh, to think about. So, I'm curious what Livingston has to say about why, uh, why engagement goes down every year you're in school. What other things might be uh, contributing to that uh, disengagement? So Livingston, we can't hear you right now. I think your microphone might be muted. Um, what would be, I know you guys have a slightly different setup. What might be helpful is if the students could respond and then maybe a teacher could go ahead up close to the microphone and repeat the question. All right, well, hold, hold your comment. We'll swing back to you guys when you figure out how to, uh, how to unmute. I know you had an answer to that, so I, I saw the mouth moving, but we just didn't hear you, so I'm not a good enough lip reader on video conference to figure it out. So, so here's where I want to go with this, right? So it's obviously important to do well in school. It's important to get good grades. I mean, all these things I don't want to undermine when I talk about this, but I think it's really important that you as students and all of us right now ask a really kind of important and fundamental question. What really is the ultimate outcome of education? Why? why? Why go through school? Why get educated, right? What is the signature of an educated person? And that's a question that Gallup has been very interested in from a number of angles. And I want to share with you some of the research we've been doing on what we call well-being. Now, when I first say that word, a lot of people think I'm just talking about wellness. And that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about how people rate their lives, right? So if I ask you on a scale of zero to 10, how do you rate your life? 10 being the best imaginable, zero being the worst. How do you rate your life? We've been very interested in studying what makes the most successful, happy people in the world successful and happy, right? I mean, that's a pretty interesting question. So instead of studying why sick people are sick or why unhealthy people are unhealthy, Gallup has been studying what makes successful people successful and happy people happy. And so here's what we've learned through our worldwide research. We've found five key domains that are important to how you evaluate your life. And I'll just be very brief and then give you examples of these, right? So one domain is what we call career well-being, which sounds pretty much like what it is, liking what you do each day, doing what you're best at at work. Social well-being is to what degree you have deep relationships in your life. Um, financial well-being, again, fairly self-explanatory, physical and then community well-being. And so let me tell you what these are because it's important. Research has shown that if you're doing well in these domains and understand what the essence of these are, it's kind of a prescription for success in life, right? So it's a really important thing to think about. So let me quickly go through these and then I want to hear your thoughts on how you think you can align what you're doing in school and how you're thinking about career and life beyond that to these things. So career well-being, interestingly enough, is the most important domain of well-being. So people who have high career well-being are more likely to be thriving in all the rest of their life. So this is really important to think about because it says what you do for your job and your work ought to really be something that you're super excited about, right? So typical examples, I've mentioned these, being able to say strongly agree to, I like what I do each day, I do what I'm best at every day. Social well-being is the depth of relationships you have in your life. So this is not how many friends you have. It's not, I have 3,000 friends on Facebook. It's whether or not you have really deep relationships with your friends, with your family. And what's interesting is uh, just thinking about how these questions are, wor are worded. The relationships in my life are as strong as they possibly can be. That's a tough one to say strongly agree to, but to think about how you work on building the depth of relationships Here's an interesting one. People who have high social well-being 
spend six hours a day socializing with friends. Now you're probably wondering, how the heck do I find six hours a day to socialize with friends? And think of your parents, right? They're working full-time jobs. How do they have six hours a day to socialize with friends? You know what the answer is? You better have friends at work or friends at school because that's how you can get six hours a day spent with friends, right? Otherwise, it's kind of impossible to squeeze in six hours a day outside of work or school socializing. So interesting little tidbit. Um, I'm going to skip over financial well-being a little bit because that's a little bit further from where you are as students. Um, and same thing with physical well-being. But community well-being is an interesting one. Now, a lot of what we've done in the United States is we've encouraged you, young adults, to get involved in as many things as possible, right? We've been espousing this for a long time. You know, you're supposed to build a resume that lists 19 different activities that you're involved with, extracurricular, sports, all these different things. And I would say, just be very cautioned around that advice because what Gallup has learned, people who have high community well-being are people who say yes to this kind of statement. In the last 12 months, I've been recognized for contributions I've made to my community. The only way you get to that place, obviously, is if you've been deeply, meaningfully engaged with one or two things. In other words, if you're just a member of 17 different organizations, kind of loosely affiliated with them, you're never going to get to this kind of place where you can say yes to this item. But we know that people who say yes to this, it's what our researchers call the difference between a good life and a great life. So, you know, even what you're being told in terms of the path to success right now, if one of those uh, pieces of advice is to get involved in all kinds of things, it may be at the cost of getting involved in one or two things in a very meaningful way. So I'm not suggesting that you don't try to explore a bunch of different things, but I want to encourage you all to think about finding one or two things that you get involved with and stay involved with through your entire career in high school or as you get to college or in the workplace in your community that you find one or two things that you really dig into. So um, I'm just curious to get your response on what Gallup knows about successful and happy lives and how you might think about uh, how you navigate your school and your life to fit some of these parameters. Any ideas or thoughts that came to you as I was mentioning these things? In Livingston, are you guys uh, live now? Yes. I don't know if you can yes. hear us or not. We can, can hear you now. Yep. Oh. Yay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what about community involvement? Isn't that what you said, Brian? Brian, did you ask yeah, about so the, community yeah, involvement? Yeah, the, the idea of in, exactly. Yep. Okay. And think about some some ways that you're involved with the community. Will you say that? Come up here and say that up loud. Uh, uh, we have to do a forty hours community service here to graduate. The, for various people that we don't know. Hear that? Yeah. So, so I'm just curious. Is that you know, if um, is that forty hours focused on one particular place or entity, or is that, or that can be spread around any number of things that would qualify as community service? It's uh, spread around. Okay. So, so that's an interesting point to think about, right? Because Gallup's research would say that that forty hours would be best leveraged focused on one entity. I'm just going to make it up, right? A, a soup kitchen, or as opposed to spending three hours volunteering for eight different organizations in the community. So it's just something to think about. How can you get deeply engaged with that 40 hours as opposed to spreading it too thinly? You know, if I call a reference for you and you say you volunteered at a community shelter, uh, and I call that community shelter, are they going to remember your name? Are they going to know who you were, right? And if you'd only been there one or two times to volunteer, the answer is probably not. But if you sunk all 40 of your hours into that place, they're most definitely going to remember you. So that's just a great example of thinking about how you might use those 40 hours to the max. So Chinook, any, uh, any comments on career or social or community well-being? Um, like 4-H, we have a program called 4-H and it's like a group of people that go around and kind of help and we do animals and projects and we sell them and we have fun and we go to places and try to help out and yep. 
So for, yeah, 4-H is a great example of something you can get involved in and stay involved with for a long period of time. That's great. So let me segue to another recent study we did about, um, this was a study we did of young Americans ages 18 to 35, right? So fairly recent high school and college graduates. This was a representative sample of Americans, so basically representative of the population of 18 to 35 year olds. And what we were interested in was whether or not certain 21st century skills learned in school were predictive of their success in work. And so when we did this study, we asked all kinds of questions about in school, did you experience any of the following things? And it was a long list of stuff, like whether you use technology. One interesting example was whether you were exposed to global affairs, learning about other cultures around the world. Some of the things were about whether you were engaged in critical thinking, uh, communication where you were um, given opportunities to present to groups, etc. So there was a long list of these kind of 21st century skills that we were interested in. And it turned out that there were two particular experiences that if you had these in school, you were twice as likely to be successful in work later in life. And here's what the two were. Number one was that you were engaged in a project that lasted longer than a few classes to complete. So a long-term project in school, right? Not just a short paper or something like that. The other one was whether you were applying what you were learning to a real world problem, whether that was something in your community, in your state, in your country, et cetera, but applying what you were learning to a real world problem. What's interesting is when I say those two things, they probably shouldn't sound very surprising to you. You're like, yeah, okay, well, a long-term project, obviously you're putting a lot of work and effort into that. You're probably getting to a deeper level of learning than you know, short-term projects. And the other one, being able to apply what you're learning to something real, makes it very relevant. So it's interesting because if we just pause on those two examples, every single subject you learn could theoretically be learned through those two lenses, right? Long-term projects that you and the teacher might be able to create and making sure that what you're learning is being applied to some kind of real world problem. So I would love to hear examples of how those two things have happened for you. Examples of long-term projects you've done through school, um, and examples of uh, applying what you're learning to real world scenario. And I would love to hear your comments on to what degree you think that's happening. And is that happening in every subject for you? Is that happening once uh, a semester? Is it happening for one particular teacher? Um, I'm just curious about examples and also to what degree it's, uh, it's taking place in your experience. So we want to start with Chinook. In English, our teacher has a student professional portfolio everything we've done in the past few years and it helps the real world job. Did you hear that? Yeah, I heard pieces of it. The, the English teacher asked them to create a portfolio of what they've done and how they think about connecting to a job. Did I get, did I get most of it? Yeah, yes you did. That's great. We're farmers, and my dad makes us calculate how much grain is in the bins and how much acres takes to get all that grain and all that kind of stuff. That's an incredibly real-world example. But, you know, that's, that's a great example of how your father, obviously, um, is helping in a very important educational way. So whether that's happening in school or not, you know, that's a, that's a perfect example of applying what you're learning to real-world scenarios on your own farm. That's very cool. So Livingston, uh, examples that uh, you guys have been exposed to that relate to long-term projects or applying to real-world problems? Right. Real-world problems or what's the other one? Long-term. Long-term projects. Um, the only projects I can think of are papers that we're required to write in our world history class that usually span through. Would you stand right up here and talk really loud? Um, I heard you. Um, I had a world history teacher that we would do about four papers throughout the year and each of them would span about over a quarter of the year that we'd have to work on. Um, one of them we wrote on the power of virtues and how they are meaningful and how, you, they can, how they make you a better person and how you can be 
the best kind of human and also what it means to be human divine through virtue. Like you have an understanding of that, it can, you can use that throughout life. That's a great, that's a great example. You know, it, it's funny, it reminds me of probably my favorite and toughest assignment I ever got in college. One of my uh, professors, Alma Blunt, very first class, literally, we walked in first class of the semester, her first class, and, and the assignment was, she didn't even give a lecture. She just said, I want you to write a three-page paper on your purpose in life. <laughs> and we we're all like, whoa, I mean, you know, like, talk about a big question, right? First thing, we're like, well, what do we do? Like, where do we go for information or whatever? You know, everybody was looking for some advice and guidance on it, and she gave us nothing. We just literally had to go away and write a paper on what we believed our purpose in life was. And so I just remember how difficult that assignment was, how, how, how powerful it was to actually think about that, um, because it just helps put into perspective all the all the work that you have to do, right? What is it ultimately being aimed at and, uh, and being careful about how it fits for you. So that's a, that's a great example. Thanks for sharing that one. Any other quick ones? I have one that just came in on email. Perfect. All right, so we also have um, an impact and learning of, on Global Citizens class that is joining us from the Bitterroot on an RSS feed. And they write, we do a community cooking group and give 125 hours a week volunteering, learning cooking, and also to make video skits. A student made the, the program up in 2007, and many adults didn't want to do it. In, two, in 2010, we added a whole year of international meals and did presentations at Hamilton High School on India. It was great. We do career skills, and now we're also making a cookbook. It is so hard because some of our teachers don't like the amount of time we spend in the program. Wow. See, I mean, that, that's a, by the way, that's an amazing example. I mean, long-term project, applying to a real world, right, putting all of your, you know, kind of community service hours into one focused initiative, doing it as a group. Those are amazing examples that um, I just think are so powerful based on the research that we know about at Gallup. And, and it's interesting to, ha you know, to have a comment that some teachers, you know, find that to be challenging or difficult. I mean, you know, we, we have an environment, right, at a national level where we have put so much emphasis on testing. This is interesting data, right? Um, I've talked to some school districts that say that 25% of their school days are dedicated to preparing for tests or taking tests, right? Now, I'm not gonna say that we need to get rid of standardized tests, but I will tell you that I'm very concerned that we've gone overboard on how much emphasis we put on standardized testing, because what it does, of course, is it forces everybody, principals, teachers, you as students in the classroom into a mode where you've got to put a lot of time into teaching to the test, testing environment, right, all that kind of stuff at the cost of doing some of these other really important things like long-term projects and, you know, thinking about creative assignments and ways to turn it into project-based learning and, you know, even thinking about individually. Like if I'm a teacher who has 30 students in a classroom, each and every one of you are totally unique and different, right? Gallup actually has done a lot of research on this, just like a fingerprint, how everybody has a unique fingerprint. Every single person on the planet has a unique talent profile, right? And so our jobs as teachers, our jobs as students, all of us parents is to try and figure out how we identify your unique talent profile and get you in a place where you're maximizing that, right? And that's very difficult to do if you're a teacher with 30 different kids in the classroom, how can I teach all 30 of you something different, etc.? I mean, that, that is a very real challenge, but I think it's important to know that as students, you guys can also be the architect of your education. You can suggest projects. You can be involved in things that are connected to school, but not necessarily in the classroom. And I think your encouragement to your teachers of the things that are making you engaged, that have your interests, that you're really excited about, I encourage you not to be bashful about um, talking about doing more of that because I, I find that you know most teachers are going to be very supportive of uh, trying to get behind it. But but that's part of it. This is a relationship. I mean, the teacher can't do it all. You guys can't do it all. And so you know, I think it, I would encourage you to to think about your classroom as a relationship where you know you and your teacher are very much a a partnership in this process. So thanks for that great example. Keep up the great work. So I want to um, 
close with uh, allowing plenty of time for you guys just to answer open-ended questions, but um, I want to skip forward. One of the articles that I sent you um, was essentially about uh, what I've been calling the new Bill of Rights for students. And, um, and I just want to pause on this point real quick because um, it's something that I would love your feedback on. So as Gallup synthesizes all of its research about what's important in life and what's important in school, it turns out that what makes your parents engaged in their jobs and their lives is very, very similar at a fundamental level to what makes you engaged in school and in your lives, right? And so they're kind of what we call the fundamentals of human development, right? What's, what's just basic necessity of developing as a human being, regardless of what age you are, whether you're in fifth grade or you're 50 years old, right? There are certain fundamentals. It turns out, this is an interesting one, then when we ask Americans to describe their best teacher, and we've done polling on this, we say, think about your best teacher, put that person's name in your head, and then we ask them open-ended to describe what made that person their best teacher. The number one word that Americans use to describe their best teacher is care, that they talk about how their teachers cared about them. So there's a whole host of ways that a teacher could show that they care about you, right? They ask you about your hopes and dreams, they want to get to know what makes you tick, they want to know about more about you than just what you do in the classroom. So lots of examples, but that's a really fundamental one that also is true in the workplace. So if you have a manager or supervisor in your job and you say that person cares about my development, if you feel that that's the case, you're much more likely to be engaged. So if I just synthesize a whole bunch of the best research we've done over decades, there's a really simple piece that I want everybody to be driving towards in school, right? And it's the idea of these three things, that every day a student should be able to come into school and say that they have a teacher who cares about their development, right? That there's someone there that expresses that in great ways. That they also can say that they're either doing or trying to discover what they like to do each day. So this isn't about just having fun, right? I mean, it's, it's a little different than that. It's, it's a more fundamental question of, I like what I do each day, which is different than just saying, oh, I had fun doing that, right? There's a subtle but important difference there. And that the third thing is that every day, not once a week, not once a month, not once a semester or once a year, but every day you can come in and say, I'm either doing or trying to figure out what I'm best at. So obviously we need to talk about all the other content and subject matter that needs to be learned. You obviously have to know how to read and write. There's certain curriculum that needs to be delivered as part of school, but these are what we call the fundamentals. And I'm curious to uh, just hear your reaction. Does this sound uh, interesting to you? Does it sound like uh, pretty important fundamentals for how you can be successful? What would you do if you were the principal of the school uh, to change uh, some of these things so that there is more of this happening, right? Do you have ideas that if, if you were calling the shots today, you would just make it happen and, and wave your magic wand. I would love to hear your feedback on this student bill of rights that we've uh, uh, suggested here through our research. Let's go ahead and start with Livingston since they're up. All right, Livingston, you're up. Okay, Janet's coming up. Okay, so if I was principal, yeah. okay, um, okay, great. Relationship to my teacher and the student. <laughs> well, yeah, the student, of course. And probably walk into the classroom and see how everybody's doing. Yeah. Those are great suggestions. <laughs> Yeah, those are, I just want to comment real quickly on that. I mean, that, you know, the idea of the principal working hard to build relationships with the teachers in the building, you could argue that that's actually their most important job. So principals obviously need to be concerned with student engagement, your engagement, and the idea of walking into classrooms and, you know, understanding being a part of that is very real. But in many ways, you know, if you think about the research, if teacher engagement drives student engagement, the most important job of the principal is to make sure that the people who work there are engaged, which is the teachers. So your first answer was a brilliant answer of, you know, building the relationships with the teachers in the building. That's probably one of the most important functions that a principal can do, thinking about how they recognize those teachers, 
um, how they support those teachers. That's all a really, really critical role as principal. So I thought you did a great job on that answer. Thank you. What else from Livingston? And then we'll move over to uh, Chinook. Okay. Alex? No, stand up there. There's a microphone that picks up your voice better. Okay. Well, if I was the principal and like we had a big gym period and there's like I don't know the mile run or something big going on, I'd dress down and go run with the kids for a little while. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Hey, I think that's a great idea. Maybe phys ed should be mandatory for the principals and teachers too, huh? <laughs> that's good thank you guys for those examples so Chinook you guys have had a couple more minutes to think about this so uh, what uh, what would you do if you were principal I would like how the teachers do uh, take five minutes in the class to do something active and fun awesome. I would push for more student teacher interaction and uh, reward teachers, I mean, not, te well, yeah, teachers and students who do good, not just let them do whatever they want. If they're, the students are doing their best, allow them certain privileges, don't just let them do whatever they want. So these are uh, j just some other great examples. I mean, I, I love the idea of, um, you know, you essentially mentioned a couple things, uh, more free time for teachers and students to interact, you know, carving out that time for just play or interaction. That's something that we've really lost track of in schools, right? We were so over-programmed, we're so focused on, you know, getting through our list of things that we're required to get through that we've kind of lost track of that freeform time, you know? And there's actually a lot of education experts that are arguing that one day a week of the school year ought to be designed by the student. In other words, you know, four days a week are taught by the teachers, the curriculum, and one day a week would be a day that you just design your own educational experience around. So um, I'm curious what you think of that idea. That's a, that's a creative one that gets at this kind of creating more free time. So what do you guys think about taking one day a week to create your own educational experience? Awesome. <laughs> There's some Show hands all the favor. That's cool. I have a comment from the Bitterroot as well. Yes. So they say that they agree, the agreement from the students on caring, exclamation point, exclamation point. A new principal at Hamilton High School did a mentoring slash model move, moment during the announcement, which was cool. He mentioned 10 kids as models for others, mm. and the kids were all very different. Some were freshmen, seniors, and different recognition as to why they were highlighted. Um, they really liked that he did this. Uh, it showed that he cared about all of us, not just the jocks or yeah. whatever, whatever else. Is. Yeah, that's a great example. So think about, think about how simple it is to give people recognition, right? And we all lose track of this, especially in the workplace. You know, a lot of managers just aren't very good at giving recognition. And it doesn't have to be something formal, right? It's not like you always have to give somebody a trophy or have some awards presentation. But, you know, this example describing here of mentioning a few students and some of the things they're doing over the public announcement system in the morning, I mean, that's a brilliant example of recognition. And, you know, they didn't have to get a ribbon or a trophy or anything like that, but someone mentioned what they were doing, gave them a pat on the back, um, and that's a really important example. I mean, this can be done in every classroom. You know, to think about not just expecting your teachers to give you more recognition and your principals to do it, but as students, right, to think about the simple ways that you can recognize your classmates by just a simple thing like saying, you did a really great job on that, or I love the question you just asked, or something like that. I mean, the, there are these simple gestures of recognition and praise go an awful long way. And if you have ambitions to be a manager or a leader someday, whether you're in you know, a uh, school, whether you're in a business, whether you're in a government role, if you have an ambition to be a leader or a manager, it's important to start learning how to give great recognition and praise to people now. So, <coughs> excuse me, think about how you can start to exercise that and practice that in, uh, in your experiences in the classroom. So, very cool example. Thank you for that one. Yes. I also have a question from the teacher of this group of students. Oh, good. And so, she works with seven different school districts um, 
down in the bitter root and is wondering how to overcome objections from teachers and administration in order to build consensus, consensus to get these programs up and running? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, right? So all these things that we're talking about today, I mean, they're, they're, there's definitely excitement and energy and enthusiasm for them, but they're also going against the grain of, of certain things that, that have just been part of the mindset of schools for a long time, right? So I mentioned, obviously, that we're, you know, kind of overly focused on standardized testing. We've dedicated so much time and energy to that. Um, and over the last 20 years, you know, it hasn't really moved the needle nationally. We haven't improved standardized test scores in the U.S., even though we've been focused on it. But there's also, you know, there are teachers who are used to teaching certain ways. That's how they were taught to teach. That's how they've taught for, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 years, and that's how they view their classroom. Um, so even teachers are at varying levels of, you know, kind of everything from understanding to their own personal philosophy about teaching and how it should be done. And so there's always going to be, when we're suggesting changes in school, right, there's always going to be natural resistance points. I think one of the powerful things that, uh, that, that is the reason why I'm excited about my job is that there's a lot of research that is starting to point us in the direction of what works. And we ought to be citing that research and referring to that research as we make our case to make changes, right? So the idea of having some more free time to explore what you're interested in, the idea to be working on longer term projects and applying it to real world situations, you can do this in English class, you can do it in math, you can do it in science. It's not like it, it can only be done in one subject or other. My point about it is there's a lot of research and growing research that says it's the right direction for us to head. So my advice to teachers who are trying to push this change especially is to rely on some of that research, to cite that, to rely on organizations like Gallup uh, and some of the stuff we put out as a, uh, as a way to make your case for it. And, and also to know in your heart of hearts Right, the best teachers all know this. Um, they're, when we study the best teachers, this is interesting for you to know, um, they're usually very high in individualization, which means that there are people who just intuitively walk into a room and they look at all the students or people in that room and they just instantly, naturally want to get to know what makes each one of them tick differently, right? So they're interested in knowing, you know, what motivates Brandon different than Kelly or Joey, right? And so when you're a teacher, a great teacher with high individualization, a lot of the things we're doing in schools right now are going against the grain of your ability to do individualization with students in your classroom. So, you know, there's your own instinct is fighting it, but the good news is there's a lot of research that's backing this up. And I would just say, uh, you know, lean on that make a case that this is the right direction to go and obviously you're going to have a lot of support from students and quite a few parents I would argue because they'll see very quickly these changes how much more engaged they are uh, in the educational process. I think if right, right about now we should probably see if there's any questions because I know that Chinook's probably going to have a period change here very shortly. Um, so Chinook uh, we'll start with you. Do you have any questions? It looks like Livingston, too, is about to have it. Yeah. <laughs> about that time. Any, any last-minute questions or thoughts for Mr. Bustine before, before we go today? What was your name college? Say it again, Tay. I'm sorry. What, yeah. what was your majors in college? What was your major oh, in college? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um... I majored in public policy studies, and um, I was actually just telling the, the crew that's here in the studio with me this morning that it, I, it, it, was, it was a perfect fit for the work that I do because a lot of what they made us do was uh, synthesize really complex issues, right? So we'd read books and papers and all kinds of information about a particular issue, let's just say an environmental problem, right? And, and then the assignment would be to write a one-page memo with a recommendation to a decision maker on what to do about it, right? So we had to synthesize literally thousands of pages of research and interviews and different perspectives and try and boil it down on one page. And so a lot of my job is actually, in my, my role at Gallup, is taking a lot of complex research and trying to boil it down in simple ways that translate to uh, people who are, you know, not deep in the research literature. And so, interestingly enough, it's been a, big, uh, a great background for me. So, um, you know, but I think it's probably the case that I didn't know I was going to be in this job when I chose to major in public policy. I just did it because actually I heard 
that there were some of the best teachers uh, in the public policy program in the world there, right? I don't know where I heard that, but I heard it on a tour when I visited Duke. And I thought to myself, geez, people are raving about the teachers in this public policy program. I didn't really know what public policy was all about. It sounded cool. But that, that what attracted me to it was that there were great teachers there. People just raved about the faculty. And I thought, you can't go wrong picking something where people are raving about the faculty. So I would say it's less about you know, necessarily picking the subject and also thinking about the kind of people that are going to be your mentors and guides in that process. And I just had amazing uh, faculty members who are still mentors of mine to this day. So uh, thanks for that question. How would you describe your school experience? Your elementary high school, how would you describe your experience? Uh, that's a good question. So um, I think throughout, a lot of my, um, my heroes and mentors in life are, are teachers, gym teachers. Um, you know, there was always somebody along those lines, whether it was elementary school. I mean, certainly, you know, we all have uh, teachers who are not so great. We have some teachers that are great. I always tried real hard, if I could, if I had any control over it, to get to those teachers that everybody raved about. So if I ever had the chance to select a course, I did it. Obviously, in elementary and middle school, you kind of had the teachers that you were assigned and didn't have much um, choice with it. But um, so I would say that uh, I certainly remember the things I was taught, right, the content I was taught, but the stuff that stands out in, in my memory that's been most powerful to me now are the teachers who, like most Americans, took the time to care about me, right? And I, I remember a couple of, of poignant examples of uh, coaches, for example. I was a, a, a distance runner. I ran track and cross country. And, and I remember a coach once who sat me down and said, Brandon, I don't care what kind of runner you become when you get older. I care what kind of man you become. Those were examples of really powerful mentor statements, right, that, you know, you would think the coach would just care about how fast you run the two mile or the mile. And when you knew that they uh, put it into the framework of what kind of person you became, you knew they cared about you a lot. So I would just say that I always gravitated towards those folks. I tried my best to, uh, to be in front of them, to be in their classrooms, to take time with them outside of class. And so, you know, this is very much what you make of it, right? You're going to get dud teachers all throughout your career, uh, all the way through college. But, you know, you can also try and put yourself in a position where you get the most out of those great ones. And I would just say, when you find a great one, uh, get everything you can out of that person. You know, uh, anytime outside the classroom, that was a critical part of my experience that I had to make the most of. I mean, someone didn't hand that to me. I had to do the work to make that happen. So as students, uh, I would just say you can't be passive learners. You've got to make it happen for yourself. And by the way, I went all the way through public schools, all the way through uh, high school, and, uh, and I love my public school experience. And so it was just more about what I made of it as opposed to, you know, picking the right school or having enough money to get to the right school, that kind of thing. I have sports. What were the two sports you participated in at Duke? Uh, so I, I ran cross country and track, and uh, and also ran indoor track. So it was all running, but um, but technically speaking, it was two different sports: cross country in the fall and track in the spring. And um, no one really uh, obviously watches the runners at Duke. We I think for our first cross country meet, there were like seven people standing in the golf course watching us run. Um, but my claim to fame is that I played pickup basketball with one of the Duke basketball players and got my front tooth knocked out. So that that's my only claim to fame at Duke was. One of the basketball players knocked out my front tooth, so. <laughs> Steven? How do you think of standardized testing evaluating students? Well, I've made a couple comments about it, so just to be real clear, I, I'm not saying that we get rid of standardized testing, but, but I am a very strong proponent of drastically reducing the amount of emphasis we put on the importance of standardized testing. Standardized testing, if you look at performance on tests like the SAT, I'll give you a real good zinger here. HOPE, H-O-P-E, HOPE, which we define as one's ideas and energy for the future. So you can measure this reliably. There's published papers on this. But HOPE is a much stronger predictor of college completion than SAT scores, ACT scores, or your high school GPA. 
Now, I'm not saying that those three things aren't important, right? They matter, but they don't account for as much of the variance of success as something like hope. Now, think about this. We're not measuring hope in schools, right? We're not talking about how to boost the hope of students. We're talking about how to boost your SAT scores and your state standardized test scores. And in reality, we've got strong evidence that says that hope is a much more important thing to focus on than standardized tests. So it's not get rid of standardized tests, but we need to think about them in their rightful place in that they only predict a small component of long-term success in school and life. And if we're not paying attention to those other human development factors, we're in big trouble. So it is critical for you to have goals. It's critical for you to see many paths to achieving that goal. And it's critical for you to have confidence that you can accomplish those. Those are the elements of hope. So to think about your teachers and mentors that help ask simple questions like, what's your goal, Brandon? And how are you going to get there? And if you only have one answer for that, they ought to be challenging you on the five other ways that you're going to do that and building your confidence in your ability to get there. So it's just a simple example where, uh, again, I'm not saying we get rid of standardized tests, but we've gone so overboard on it. There's so many other important things we need to be measuring as part of a, a rounded portfolio and scorecard of a, of a successful human being. And hope and engagement uh, are critical ones. So um, that's why I've spent a good amount of time talking about those pieces today. And by the way, if you, if, you're, if you have high hope, that accounts for a whole letter grade. So students that are high hope do a whole letter grade better than students with low hope. So this fluffy thing called hope actually does translate to increased performance on things like grades, which is pretty cool to think about. I think Chinook's good for now. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Chinook. It's been great to talk to you all today. Appreciate it. <laughs> Have a good week. All right, thank you, everybody. Please take a moment in just thanking Mr. Bustee for coming and speaking with us today. So thank you very thank much. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.